what a what a refreshing what a refreshing word on on giving by planting our seeds and really laying of Christ in our lives. Is this, uh, do I sound all right, guys? Is my mic working all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm on. We're good. Test, test, test. Hey, I told you earlier was the most anointed I was going to be. Now you can't even hear me. I'll take a, I'll take a handheld. Thank you. I got it now. Thank you. world of division, the church is meant to be a uniting force, and we have an opportunity to celebrate today because in 1863, Abraham Lincoln passed the Emancipation Proclamation to end slavery, but it only ended in the states that were a part of the Union. It only ended in the states. In those states, it didn't get, it didn't end until June 19th of 1865, which we celebrate today is called Juneteenth. And it's a day of freedom. It's like 2000, come on, amen. 2000 years ago, 2000 years ago is when Jesus set us free. But only when we come to the true knowledge of him can we experience that freedom. In the same way that though there was a proclamation of freedom it wasn't experienced until everybody knew about it and everybody heard about it and everybody could celebrate it and everybody could participate in it. And I think that that symbolizes what the church is all about. We're here to reveal the freedom that's already been given to us. We're here to tell about the freedom that Jesus has paid so dearly for us to have. We're here to set the captives free because Jesus did the work on the cross but it's our job to tell the world that it's done. It's our job to tell the world that everybody has been made free. Everybody has been given a chance to have eternal life by just simply accepting this free gift called Jesus Christ as your Savior. Everyone can experience this freedom if they know the truth. Because as we well know, the truth will make us free. Amen. It's the truth we know. The truth doesn't make us free until we know the truth. Once we know the truth, it makes us free. The truth cannot make you free until you know it's truth. Only when you said, yes, I believe, God raised Jesus from the dead, and Jesus truly is Lord. It's when you said, when you said it is not when it made Jesus Lord. When you said it, it set you free. And when you said it, it put it into operation in your life. Jesus already was Lord. But when you said it, you connected to the power to experience his presence and his salvation and his victory in your life. Amen? And so we take advantage of days like this where we celebrate what God has done in our country. And we know... The devil's done a lot in our country too. But we want to praise God for the things that Jesus has done for us. We want to praise God for the things that God has given us in this country and around the world. Take America out of the world and take a lot of the freedom out of the world with it. We are a safety net for a lot of nations that would be bullied and pushed around if it wasn't for the freedom that we have in this country. We celebrate it in a couple weeks on the 4th of July, Independence Day, but we celebrate equality for everybody, for everybody deserves to be equal because God made us all in his image. And we have got to be the people that stand up for equality. Amen? Come on. Because Jesus did it all. Jesus did it all. A special shout out to one of our dear members who was a member of Life Changers Church at our city campus for many, many years. He was 89 years old. He passed away a few, a couple of weeks ago. Mr. Alvin Edward Kennedy, our dearly loved pillar in our church at our city campus. Can we just praise God for his life? Went home to be with the Lord on May 30th. He was 89 years old. Of course, we thank God for his family and the family that he led. He was a greeter. 
for years at our, at our Life Changers Church campus downtown in the city. And everybody loved him. He's always smiling. He always wore a suit. He always was just dressed impeccably. He always had a smile. He always had love. And that's gone to be, that has, what's, got, what's gotten us all to be a people of love is people like him and members like him and sweet man of God who's now home to be with the Lord. Amen. So we congratulate him on his home going. And we celebrate his family, and we have his family's back, and we always will. Amen. I'm hearing you guys talking through the monitor, so if you can take yourself out and put me only in here. Just kidding. <laughs> you know, many Christians are fighting. Can you guys hear me now? Many Christians are fighting a battle they just don't know where it stems from. You know, Abe talked about roots a few moments ago and a root system. And there are some fruit in people's lives, some problems in people's lives, some, some real struggles in people's lives that they don't know where it comes from. But I can tell you where it comes from. It comes from the same place. I talk about it every year on Father's Day, and I try to talk, it, talk about it every day with somebody because I just want to get the truth of our Heavenly Father out to this world. And if you look in John chapter 14, verse 8 in the Amplified Bible, Philip says something very powerful that has stuck with me for years and years. And he says to Jesus, show us the Father, Lord. Show us the Father, Lord. Cause us to seek the Father. Cause us to see, I should say. Cause us to see the Father. That is all we ask. And then we shall be satisfied. These are profound words that ring in my soul and have for years. When Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, it's something different than Philip saying, Lord, show us God. He could have said, Lord, show us the Creator. He could have said, Lord, show us the miracle worker. He could have said, Lord, show us the lawgiver. He could have said, Lord, show us the Almighty. But he said, Lord, show us the Father. You know, the fact that God is the creator will never satisfy you. The fact that God is almighty will never satisfy you. The fact that God is all-powerful will never satisfy you. The fact that God is God will never satisfy you. But when you know him as Father, when you see him as Father, then, Philip says, then, we shall be satisfied. Then we shall be satisfied. Why is this world so dissatisfied? They know God as a God. They know God as a creator. Most Christians know God as an almighty and lawgiver. But the only thing that will truly satisfy is when you know him as father. When you know him as father. That's why I love that song. Dearest father, closest friend. You see, God's trying to get us past doing religion. He's trying to get us doing a relationship. When you know God is your father, everything seems to fall in place. Everything seems to work out. Everything seems to not hurt as much. Now, there's a lot of pain in this world. But it doesn't hurt as much when you know God as Father, when you know him as closest friend. I'm praying for that for each of us. I'm praying for that because the devil is really good at creating religion. Religion causes you to feel shame for your failures, shame for your weaknesses, shame for your mistakes, shame so that you won't go to the Father. Shame so that you won't run to him. Shame so that you will run any other way except to God. Religion shames people. Religion puts law and causes everyone to fail because there's none of us that can keep all of the laws. No, no one has ever been able to except Jesus himself. And yet we keep 
beating people up over their failures. We keep beating ourselves up over our failures and over our mistakes. And beloved, this Father's Day, stop beating yourself up and let him father you. Stop beating others up and let God father them. Because we all have a lot of reparenting to do. We all have a lot of work to do on our soul. We all have a lot of growing up to do. We all have a lot of maturing to do. That's why he says, I write to you young men. He says, I write to you children. John said, I write to you children. I write to you young men. I write to you fathers. There is a progressive growth pattern that God is involved in our lives with. And we are expecting everybody to be fathers already. We're expecting everybody to skip childhood and skip young adulthood into fatherhood. We expect Christians to come out just doing everything right, living completely with no mistakes, no failures, no shortcomings in their lives. And we have to understand this Christian journey is an evolution. It's a progressive process that we're all in, and God is the most patient of all the universe, that he has waited on me this long. He's waited on you this long. I got stuff I'm thinking about in my life. I got stuff from back years ago that I can think, wow, look at how God was so patient with me then. And then I got things from hours ago, and I'm like, wow, look at how God has been patient with me back then. I got days ago, wow, look at how God was patient with me back then. You see, we, we need to never forget our frailty. We need to never forget our humanity. We need to be well aware of our Christianity, that we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We're the head and not the tail. We're above and not beneath. We're more than conquerors. Can anybody say amen? That's who we are in our Christianity. But in our humanity, we are human. We're flawed. So instead of trying to fix everything, just connect with the Father. Because that's how the power truly flows. When Philip said this, he had no idea what he was really saying. I don't believe he did, but I believe God knew exactly what Philip was saying. And God intended Philip to say that, make that prophetic declaration. Show us the Father, then we'll be truly satisfied. Show us the Father, cause us to see him as Father. Then we'll truly be satisfied. And Jesus said and responded, you know, if you've seen me, Philip, you've seen the Father. If you've seen me, he said, you've seen the Father. I wonder if our experiences together as believers, I wonder if our experience with God is as father or taskmaster, father or rule maker, father or judger. Because I don't know about you, but I'm going to the throne of grace when I talk to God, not the throne of judgment, the throne of grace. Because of the blood of Jesus, make no mistake about it, it's not because you're good enough or I'm good enough, but it's because Jesus did it all. And yet, so we can go to the Father. You know, it says, interestingly, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, where it talks about that, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. You know, I realize that a lot of Christians are not accessing the mercy. We're accessing the grace, but we're not always accessing the mercy. And you know what we need mercy for? We need mercy for the bad seeds that we've planted. We need God to help us uproot those bad seeds. That's mercy. Mercy, grace is that Jesus did all of the work for you for your salvation. And grace is God's supernatural strength and supernatural ability. But mercy is when God withholds from you the judgment that you do deserve. Mercy is when God says, you know what, you deserve to be judged, but I am going to be merciful to you and I am not going to judge you. You did plant those bad seeds, but I am going to declare a crop failure this year over the bad seeds that you sowed. That's mercy. Amen. Anybody need that? Like, it's really good to plant all the good seeds in our lives, but we need to realize something. 
a lot of times we've planted some bad seeds in our lives and other people have planted some bad seeds in our lives. And good, good news is we can go to God and obtain mercy. What is mercy? A crop failure of the bad seeds that you've sown in your life. I've had people tell me you're so wrong. That is so how dare you tell people that they can be that they can get mercy. They, they have to earn that mercy. You know, they have to be worthy. They have to repent so that they can get that mercy. If you had to repent to get the mercy, it wouldn't be mercy. If you had to be godly enough to get the mercy, you would, it wouldn't be mercy. If you had to be holy enough to get the mercy, it wouldn't be mercy. If you had to change enough to get the mercy, it wouldn't be mercy. That's what makes it mercy, because we don't deserve it. We deserve judgment. And he says, no, I'm giving you mercy. And if you knew him as father in that way, you would be running to him. But what is the devil got you doing running from God? What is the devil got your unsaved loved ones doing running from God? What is the devil got backslidden Christians doing running from God? Because they're ashamed of what they've done. They're ashamed of their life. They're ashamed of their failures. They're ashamed of their mistakes. And they can't even go to church and find mercy because the church is so full of judges and hypocrites and critics of everybody else that we have forgotten that we are a people of mercy. If you could only get a hold of this truth that our God, our Father welcomes us. He welcomes us home. The father of the prodigal son did not welcome the son home when the son got all the money that he wasted when he got it all back. To earn his place back in the father's house, how many know? That is not what happened. The father, the son did not come to repay the father. The son came having wasted everything the father gave him. And the father didn't say payback time. Told you so. I told you, son, you know, that was going to happen and you should have listened. God is not a told you so God. He's a run into you, God. He's a run and seeing you a long way off and comes running to you and throws himself on you and kisses and hugs you and kisses and hugs you. And you say, Father, the young son had re had rehearsed his speech the day before. You know that, right? Because he says exactly what he's going to say when he sees the father. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the fa my father. How many of my father's servants are eating better than me? I know what I'll do. I'll go to the father and say, Father, forgive me. And let heaven forgive me. God, forgive me. Father, forgive me for I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. Just make me like what he practiced it perfectly. Anybody remember that in the Bible? He rehearsed his speech perfectly. And when he comes back to the father. In the middle of his speech, the father interrupts him. As soon as the father, as soon as the son said, Father, I for I have sinned against heaven and the father said, stop. And he said, bring the best robe. Put it on my son. Get a ring for his finger. Give him sandals for his dirty feet. For this son has come home. You know, there is no shame in the story of the prodigal son. There is no shaming him. There is no blaming him. There is no chastising him. There is no criticizing him. There is simply welcoming him, loving him, forgiving him, embracing him. And we are robbing people of this kind of experience with their father because we shame and we blame and we expect and we demand and we criticize. And if we would stop being so caught up in trying to prove we're something, trying to prove we're good enough, trying to be holy, if we would just relax 
and go to the Father about everything. He will straighten it all out. We don't do that. Most Christians, they want it. They, they think they have to fix it, get it right, get it straight, get it fixed, get it, stop the habit, stop the doing this, stop doing that so I can go to the Father. Go to the Father with your cigarette. Amen. Go to the Father with your attitude. Go to the Father and have a relationship Amen. with someone who knows you are not perfect and gives you free access to him 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days out of the year. And as long as you have needs, you will always have access to the Father at the throne of grace, where it says we obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. You got to pay a bill, you're in a time of need. You got to fix a problem, you're in a time of need. You blew it and screwed up in a relationship, you're in a time of need. You have just gone out and willfully done what you said you would never do and you did it, you hypocrite. Guess what? You're in a time of need. It's amazing to me how most Christians think that loving God means promising God you're going to do better. I promise God I'm not going to do that anymore. I promise God I'm not going to do that anymore. And then we, we, we kind of categorize. We're like, well, but was your sin intentional? Was your sin unintentional? Like God's pretty merciful about the unintentional ones, but the intentional ones, you really got to fix that. You really got to straighten that. You really got to really, really, really be sorry for that one. I don't know of one sin that I've ever committed or you've ever committed that was ever unintentional. Everything we've ever done wrong, we intended to do. Every time you yelled at somebody and got angry at somebody, it wasn't like, oh, I didn't mean that. (laughs) That's not what I meant. I meant I love you. (laughs) Think about it. Jesus didn't come for any other reason more than this one thing to introduce you to the Father so that you could have a relationship with him the way he has a relationship with him. You say, but Jesus was perfect. That's completely 100 percent irrelevant. Jesus was the son of God. That's why he had a relationship with the Father, not because he was perfect. He was perfect and is and always will be. Can I get an amen? Amen. Well, at least we all agree about that one. Now, let me get back to the controversial ones. <laughs> he is perfect, but he doesn't have a relationship with the father based on his perfection. He has a relationship with the father based on being the father's son. And we have the same relationship. He came to give us the same relationship. Jesus did not come. His end goal was not to forgive you of all your sins. Forgiving you of your sins through his blood was to remove the barrier that separated you from the father because a holy God cannot be in the presence of sinful man. So the sin has to be dealt with and you can't deal with it yourself. So what did Jesus do? He dealt with it all 2000 years ago. It's all washed away. Therefore, giving you free access to the father at all times, you say, but uh, but I can't go into the I can't go into his presence with this sin, though. I'm still struggling with this sin. The father doesn't see that sin you're struggling with. He's not focused on that. He the Bible says that Jesus is the lamb in front of the throne. It says one translation says Jesus is in the midst of the throne in Revelation chapter seven. Jesus is in the midst of the throne. But it actually is translated as Jesus is in front of the throne. He's in front of the throne. And the reason why he's in front of the throne, the throne is the throne of grace that we're that we're reading about here. And as you've heard me say before, I'm I'm not going to let you get out of here without this getting across and you realizing that the father 
only sees you through the eyes of the lamb. Because the lamb is in front of the throne. So the father who is perfect and holy as the son is, but we're not. So the father doesn't look at us as we are. He looks at us through the lamb in front of the throne and we can't go to the father around the lamb. We don't go around the lamb to get to the father. We go through the lamb to get to the father. That's why Jesus is the lamb of God in front of the throne, because there is no access from God to you except through Jesus, the lamb. And there's no access from from you to the father except through the lamb. And that's why the lamb stands and sits at the front in the front of the throne so that we will always be able to go to the father through him. And the father will always look at us through the eye, through the lens of the blood of the lamb. Woo! So I gave up. Trying to be. The perfect Christian man for the first few years, I actually deceived myself into thinking I could really be so good, not saying that I'm not being good. I'm just saying I'm just like you. And sometimes we're good and sometimes we're not. I stopped basing my communication with God on my my current state of being. I stopped basing my communication with God on my current state of being. And I started basing my communication with God on the fact that he is my father and I'm welcome at all times and he and I have access to him for anything about anything. I can talk to him about anything or there may be some things that I don't feel like I want to talk about with him and he's okay with that. You know, there's things my kids talk to me about and then there's things they don't talk to me about. Maybe I could help them if they talk to me about it, but I'm okay with them not wanting to talk to me about it because they need their space. And the father knows that about us, man, I got a man and he's not like, well, let me see, let me check the calendar. You know what? You missed the last three days of prayer. You missed a, you. Pr- yeah, you prayed for like you prayed the other day. I remember, but you fell asleep. Remember that you fell asleep while you were praying. <laughs> I'm trying to get you. I'm simply announcing to you about the barriers have been removed between you and the father. I'm not removing the barrier. I'm just announcing to you the barrier has been removed and you can go to the father about anything, anytime, whenever you need in your time of need at all times. You go to the father because we've been given a story here, beloved, in Luke chapter 15, we've been given a story here that shows a human father. That is as as good or better than any picture anybody has ever given us about God. We have a human father here in Luke chapter 15. A man had two sons. And the younger said to his father, father, give me the portion of the goods that falls to me. (laughs) The father didn't say. What you talking about, Willis? The father didn't say. (laughs) (laughs) The father didn't say you don't deserve it. You're not mature enough. You're not going to be able to handle it. You're probably going to waste it. You know, you you've been I, I've, I've been watching, you know, I've been following you online lately, son. And, you know, I see some of the sites you've been going to and I I see some of the some of the tramps you've been, you know, wanting to hook up with. It's amazing how much freedom this father gave this son. And it's a picture of how much freedom our father gives to us. Because if a human father can give you that much freedom, how much more will a heavenly father give? The Bible says you earthly fathers know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly father give to whoever asks? You say, oh, you're saying that so that the son can feel good about what he's doing. The son did not feel good about what he was doing, because as soon as he left, it says he wasted everything he had. 
It didn't take him but one verse. Look at what it says in verse 12. Give me the portion that falls to me. So he divided them his livelihood. And then look at verse 13. And, and not many days later, I don't know about you, but not many days later means like no more than three. <laughs> not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together, journeyed to a far country and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. I wonder how many of us realize what prodigal living really is. Prodigal living is not wasting your money. Prodigal living is leaving your father's house. Prodigal living is separating yourself from your father. Prodigal living is distancing yourself from the father. He didn't go to a near country. The Bible says he went to a far country. He didn't want to just be next door to the father. He wanted to get as far away from the father as he could. He went to a far country, it says, and there wasted his possessions. We haven't been out of one verse in verse 12. He gets the possessions in verse 13. He wastes them. Boy, it doesn't take us long to waste what we have when we're not connected to our heavenly father. It doesn't take us long. It doesn't take us long. Boy, you can lose money fast in this world, can't you? All the scammers. So many scammers just. There's just a lot of scammers that are using my name to scam. I get messages all the time. Instagram is is this your account, Pastor, the one with the dash under the letter I or, you know, Gregory Dick now. You know, is that you? Why would you think it's me? First of all, why are you asking me if I'm the guy? What if I'm not the guy? What if I'm the bad guy? What if I'm the scammer? Why are you saying, hey, is this your account? Like, don't give your money to anybody because they they say there's some don't give your money to anybody except God. But let's let's start there. (laughs) You put it in the hands of other people and they're going to waste it usually unless they're good stewards and you're trusting, you know, you're honoring the Lord. You know what I'm what I'm talking about. It's the it's not. It's not that this son didn't learn anything while he was growing up. It had nothing to do with his education, nothing to do with his his attitude or demeanor. It had one, it had to do with one thing and one thing only. When you disconnect. You waste. When you disconnect, you waste. When you're disconnected to the father from the father, you waste your life. You waste your living, you waste your blessings. You and yet this father, who knows where he got all the possessions that he had. But he when the son came back, the father kept giving. Listen, I'm not telling you to be a prodigal. What I'm telling you is even as a prodigal, look how good the father was. That the son's behavior did not change the father's love. The son's behavior did not change the father's generosity. The son's behavior did not change the father's love for him. And yet we see God differently so often. But I would wish that we would When Jesus said when Philip said, show us the father, I will just tell you this. When you look at the father of this boy. Show us the father. He said, Philip said, show us the father. That's all we ask. Let's let me show you the father here. It's very simple and we'll 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 close with this. Let me show you the father. A father believed in his son. That's why he invested in his son. He believes in you. Show us the father. The father believes in you. In verse 20 of Luke, chapter 15, it says the father sees the son from a long way off when he was still a great way off. So the father believes in you. The father is looking for you. The father is waiting for you. 
father had been waiting because it's the father that saw the son from way off. The father believes in you. The father is seeking you. The father is waiting for you. The father is patient. You know, the Bible says in second Peter, chapter three, verse nine, that God is not impatient with us, but he's not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. He's very patient. The father believes in us. The father is looking for us. The father is waiting for us. The father is always moving toward us. He's always moving toward us. The Bible says in verse 20, the father starts running. The father starts running to the son. He is running. He is always moving towards you. I want you to get a hold of this. Show us the father, then we'll be satisfied. Here's the father. The father believes in you. The father is looking for you. The father is waiting for you. The father is seeking you. The father is moving towards you. The father is coming to you. The father is coming after you. The father is embracing you. The father is kissing you. When he was a far way off, his father saw him and had compassion on him. The father is full of compassion for you. The father feels deeply for you. You never have to perform another day in your life to to get God to feel deep affection for you. It is in him. It is who he is. And he feels that way about you and nothing's going to change his mind. There's some there's there's things you could say about one of my kids. I know my kids. Nothing's going to change my mind. Now I know they're they're flawed like I am, but nothing's going to change my mind, no matter what anybody says about them. Nothing's going to change my mind about them. Nothing is going to change my mind. Do you get that? nothing? And I'm an earthly human flawed father and nothing's going to change my mind about my kids. Nothing's going to stop my affection for my children. Nothing is going to get me to stop kissing them. Nothing's going to get me to stop hugging them. Nothing's going to get me to stop moving towards them. Nothing's going to get me to stop feeling compassion for them. And that's just a fraction of a fraction of the love our father has for us. Do you see when you realize the kind of relationship that you and I get to have with the father, you will your prayers are going to start going soaring. You're going to start asking boldly, thinking boldly, giving boldly, loving boldly, helping boldly, serving boldly. You're never going to be afraid another day in your life because you have access to the father at any time you have need. You might want to just talk to him for a minute and not even ask him for anything. And he loves that, too. There's never going to come a day though that he says, why are you always coming to me asking me for something, son? Why don't you just come and tell me how great I am? The father he doesn't need to say that he already is great. He doesn't need you to tell him that if you believe that, then tell him that. But he doesn't need that. Come on, let's stand together. Show us the father, the father. You know, sometimes I wonder if we're open enough to the Holy Spirit. But, you know, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, to which I am a huge fan of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which I'm a proponent of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I'm huge about those things. But I think the problem that most people have with praying in tongues and believing for miracles and healings and those kinds of things is because we have this sense of we have to earn something from the father. We have to earn something from God to be worthy of his gifts. And if we have to earn something to be worthy of his gifts, they're not truly gifts anymore, are they? The gifts of the spirit wouldn't be the gifts of the spirit if they were the credits of the spirit, like you got to earn some credits of the spirit, but it's not credits of the spirit, it's gifts of the spirit. The only reason I say that is because when the Bible says this father saw his son and went and it says he fell on his son's neck and kissed him is the same word in Greek that is used when the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter two fell upon the believers in the room that they were waiting for the Holy Spirit. 
And the same word when the father fell on this son's neck and began to kiss him. It's the same word that is used when the Holy Spirit fell on the believers in Acts chapter two. What I'm trying to get across to you is the Holy Spirit and his gifts and his presence and all the things he wants you to experience. Is a proof of his love and his adoration and affection for you. That that's what freed me to be able to receive these gifts for you to receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit is God loving us. It's not God trying to make us spiritual robots. It's God trying to fall on us. And kiss us. Kiss us with his love, kiss us with his forgiveness, kiss us with his restoration, kiss us with his deep adoration. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. The bride said in Song of Solomon, let him kiss me. The Bible says in Psalm chapter two, kiss the son, lest he be angry with you. Why would God why would the son be angry with you for rejecting his kiss? For rejecting his ki- the kiss. Is Jesus breathing in them, the Holy Spirit, the kiss is Jesus saving them. If you don't receive the kiss, if you don't kiss the son, all that's left is the wrath of God. But if you kiss the son. By simply believing that he finished it all. He did it all. There is no wrath for you because you've accepted Jesus. There's only blessing and healing. There's going to be tough times, but tough times never last. Tough people do. Well, we could talk all day about these kinds of things, and it looks like I did. So be dismissed. If you want prayer for healing, come to the altar, prayer for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, come to the altar, prayer of salvation. Just say, Jesus, come into my life. Be my savior. Jesus, come into my life. Be my best friend. Jesus, you're risen from the dead. I believe in you and you will be saved. I love you guys. You're dismissed. Have a beautiful rest of your father's day. We'll see you all soon. Wednesday night. Think like a champion. Sunday morning right back here. Love you guys. God bless.